All right, welcome back to our lecture about modeling. And in this second part of our lecture, we're going to be kind of working on what's the workflow of a model. Uh, working with this relatively simplistic kind of diagram that I actually kind of just stole from your textbook, where we're just sort of seeing this flow of information from input through a model becoming output of the model. In and of itself, this is not a tremendously exciting representation of a mathematical model, but it does give us a way of breaking up the steps of what goes into a model kind of conveniently. So if I kind of hide the model and the output part for right now, let's focus on the input aspects of a mathematical model. Now, in the context of a mathematical model, the input is going to be in the form of numerical values that are used as input for the equations or the programs or the algorithms or whatever that you're going to be working with. This is the data that is given to you or that is observations or whatever that is used as input into whatever your kind of model is. So, for example, that might be time series of data, that might be wind speed measurements, temperature, pressure, humidity, stability, pressure, uh, roughness, or whatever. Or, that might be information about the environment around your wind farm or whatever. Things like the configuration of the surface, or the terrain, or the uh, roughness uh, of the surface, or uh, the nature of obstacles to the flow, or whatever. But it is information that is being put into an existing set of equations, okay? This is, these are measurements or estimates or whatever. Um, notice that they are all numerical depictions of things that are in the real world. They are mathematical representations of the roughness of the surface or the original wind speed around the wind turbine or the temperature of the air or whatever. They are mathematical representations of real processes in the atmosphere I'm sorry, real properties of the atmosphere and the environment through which the air is moving. Now, there's a whole issue here about how accurate do those mathematical representations of these input uh, parameters have to be? How accurate do they have to be? That may or may not be critical, and that's related to this issue of chaos, which we're going to learn about in a later lecture in this module. But you can get a sense that the accuracy of the data might matter. This is accuracy in the sense of how close, actually to use a dictionary definition here of accuracy, I like the degree to which the measure, result of a measurement, calculation, or specification conforms to the correct value. This is different from precision, which is, you know, how many digits there are. We've, we've kind of talked about this whole accuracy versus precision thing before. The accuracy of information that goes into the model may or may not be critical. Um, if you are trying to compute the speed of the wind in a wake using the Anno Jensen model, you will not get the right value of the wind speed in the wake if you don't give it the correct observation of the wind speed outside the wake. You might remember it was that UI. But how critical is it? I mean, if I have the wind speed outside of the wake and I have measured it wrong and I have, have it off by a tenth of a meter per second, is the wind speed inside of my wake only off by a tenth of a meter per second? That might not be the end of the world. Is the wind speed off by a factor of two? That could be a very big problem, okay? They, it depend, there's a lot of interesting issues as to how, what is going to determine how critical it is to have accurate values that are your input to these equations. But like I said, we'll learn more about that when we learn about chaos. Your book also gets a little bit off subject here a little bit and says that it also might matter how detailed the input data needs to be. Um, detailed meaning like how many, like resolution, for example. So for example, it might be critical, um, your model might only need to know the roughness at a given location. On the other hand, your model might need to know the roughness at lots of locations around your wind farm or something like that. Uh, you might need, for example, to know just in general the slope of the train near your wind farm, or you might, for a different kind of model, might need, you know, like maps of the terrain around your model. This is all different ways of thinking about this idea of detailed. How much information are you going to need? But in general, I think the idea of the input to the model is not terribly difficult to wrap your head around. Let's talk about the model itself. Now, the model is going to be some, in the context of mathematical models, 
is going to be some kind of equation or set of equations or algorithm or program or something like that that is taking the input data and making some calculations based on that. Those calculations might be statistical, those calculations might be based on the physics of the situation or our experience with it or whatever, but the truth of the matter is almost certainly there are multiple models to choose from. There will be different ways to simulate the behavior of the situation that you're thinking about. And there are going to be a list, there's going to be a list of questions that you need to ask yourself before you would pick which model is the right one to do. In fact, your book lists seven questions, not all of which is exactly the way I would have put it, but um, let's talk about these seven questions you really should be asking yourself as a part of the process of choosing what is the right model or what are the pros and cons of the model I have chosen and so on. Now, some of the questions are a little um, vague, more vague than others, but okay. The first question you want to ask yourself is, do I understand the problem I'm trying to solve? I mean, your textbook actually throws out some verbiage here that's a little bit helpful here. If the problem is not understood deeply or completely enough, it will be difficult to choose the right model. You need to understand the problem extremely well before you can choose the tool that's going to solve the problem. So just as an example in the context of wind power, let's say you wanted to model the height of the wind at the hub height of a possible wind turbine. Sounds like a perfectly logical thing to want to do. And the truth of the matter is, talking to colleagues, talking to, looking up in journal articles, going online, you're going to find out that there's lots of different models to do this. How are you going to know what you're going to need? Well, in order to know, part of the story is you need to really understand your problem. What do you actually need? For example, do, do I, would a wind height just at the wind hub, the hub of the turbine itself be adequate? Or do you need to know the wind profile? Okay, that, that's going to completely change your answer as to what you're going to need here. Could you model the wind height at that hub with like a climatological average? Um, you know, like for example, you just need to know in general how windy it is at that hub height? Or do you need to know like at a given time? Un, you know, at this time I'm going to be expecting the winds to be this great. That's going to be a completely different answer as to what kind of tools, what kind of models would be the right tool for the job. Are you talking about just like under specific weather conditions, like, you know, in a cyclone or uh, during a storm or in under statically stable conditions or whatever? And that, that will make a difference as to what kind of model you're choosing. I mean, just to think again about like log wind profile and log linear wind profile as two examples of models you could choose from. Well, they're going to give you different answers because they're appropriate for different stability regimes. You would use the log linear profile if it's statically stable. You'd use the log profile if it's statically neutral. Okay. Um, for that matter, if you're just trying to model the winds, it might matter what you're going to be using the output for. I mean, if you're using the output to estimate the amount of power this wind turbine is putting out, having some sense, for example, of the range of values might be important. Or, yeah, I mean, you can imagine there's other contexts here in which the nature of the answer you're looking for is going to depend on what you're planning on doing with that information. So a deep, meaningful understanding of the problem is going to be your, really your first step in picking a model. You need to know what you're looking for, what information you have, what information you need, etc. long before you can make a choice as to which model would be the right tool for the job. Once you hire that far and you're starting to look at a menu of options of models that might be the right tool for the job, is another question you need to ask yourself is number two, do I understand the model? Um, that is not a subtle point. It is easy to get yourself into a situation in which you are working with a model whose behavior you don't understand. These are issues that you may need to be thinking about, like, do you have proper academic background to understand how to use this model? Do you have the proper training? Do you have the proper experience? Or perhaps more accurately, does your team have the proper experience, academic training, etc.? Here's the deal. It is relatively easy 
to download a model or write a model or code up an equation or whatever. That in and of itself is not the end of the world. The very complicated numerical weather prediction models and climate models and so on, which are nightmarishly complicated, are surprisingly easy to get installed and running on a computer. Okay, They are generally made to be fairly simple to get. Even things that are relatively complicated, like you, your team might need to have specialists who know how to install a model or how to write a computer program that models something, in and of itself, that's the easy step. Okay? It's knowing if that's the right tool for the job or not that's the hard part. I can download a numerical weather prediction model and run it on my computer. That's not the complicated part. It's, do I know what that model is doing? Is it the right tool for me? Is this model using the right equations, using the right techniques, that it's appropriate under my assumptions and so on? That is what's going to take experience. That's what's going to take a deep knowledge of the problem and a deep knowledge of the model. Problem number three that you need to, question number three you need to be asking yourself when you are trying to choose a model. Is this model at the right level of sophistication? Some models are relatively simple. That log win profile is a model, and that's a really simple one. We didn't have to do much of anything with it. We could code that thing up on your calculator. We could write an Excel spreadsheet and make graphs of it. We did things like that, okay? We could have also gotten the profile of the wind in other ways. We could have run a full numerical weather prediction model that that has the full explicit three-dimensional fluid mechanic laws that describe how the flow was swirling around in eddies and so on. But I'm not sure I would have really understood how that model was working and what assumptions it was appropriate under and and uh, what regimes it would be working under and so on and what input, how, how accurate my input data would have needed to be and so on. And I'm not sure I would have been getting a better answer than my relatively simple equation that just described the log wind profile. See what I'm saying here? Honestly, a simple model that you understand might be a better tool than a complicated model that you don't necessarily understand that might not be the right tool for the job. Thinking further about this idea that there are simple models and complicated models or simple models and sophisticated models, some of which will require very different kinds of data, a good question to be asking yourself is the fourth one. Do I have input data to match the sophisticated the sophistication of the model? I mean, for example, if you have relatively limited or relatively inaccurate input data and you put that into a complex model, that might not be a very good combination. Your, your complicated model might not be able to make a very realistic depiction of what's going on if it has relatively poor data to work with. On the other hand, maybe a simpler model doesn't have so much sophistication, doesn't have so much, isn't so sensitively designed to, <coughs> excuse me, isn't so sensitive to small and even biggish problems in your input data. I mean, a classic example of this in the context of like meteorology near the surface might be how your model is dealing with terrain. You might have a relatively simple depiction of the terrain in your area. Okay, like for example, here I found a website where it was depicting uh, a ridge line of mountains, you know, this is supposed to be like a range of mountains or something, as sort of a hump. Okay, we did something similar to that back when we did uh, like obstacles to the flow and the role of our orography and so on, where we just sort of had those Gaussian hills and so on. A relatively simple depiction of the hill. Well, no real hill looks like that simple depiction, but that might be a simple mo way to model how the flow is being constricted and you're getting gap flow along the top of the mountain. That was all a model. On the other hand, if I was trying to run a full three-dimensional fluid mechanics numerical weather prediction type model over this hill, well, the fact that the hill doesn't really look very natural might become a very big problem. You might need a more sophisticated look at the same ridge of mountains, where now you can see 
lots more detail in terms of where are their passes and where are their peaks and so on. That might be a much better match to the sophistication of your model so that it can come up with a more realistic idea of what the flow is doing. If you don't have access to detailed input information like this, you might be better off with a model that doesn't need that very high level of sophistication to the input data. Hmm. Now that takes us through four of the questions you need to ask yourself as you're deciding what kind of model you're going to be choosing. Let's take a little breather here for a moment and look at two more questions before we move on to the second part of this, the part three of the lecture, the second part of this list. Question three. Which of the following is not an example of the kinds of information that are used as input for a mathematical model of the atmosphere? A. Temperature. B. The ideal gas law. C. Humidity, temperature, uh, pressure, D, humidity. Hmm, these all sound like things a model needs, but not all of those things are, are input. All right, make a choice from those four options as to which one is not input, and we'll get some feedback before you go on to question four.